Hello everybody, welcome back to Stoke Sound Podcast. Today I have special guest Patch Bichelle and uh, Patch, introduce yourself, how are you doing? Hello Ed, how are you doing? I'm very good, I'm very good. Um, Feels good. Introduce myself, well, I, uh, I'm i a producer, yeah. uh, a mixer, a uh, vocal producer slash editor and just general, you know. A legend. Lover of general <laughs> legend, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, for those that, of you that um, are listening now Patch is an amazing producer and mixer me and Patch we go long back from uh, our university days so far back I know literally day w- no not even day one pre-day one I know time goes quick doesn't Do it mean? I just think seven it was like years, what seven years. years ago makes me sick wow I'm so old um, but yeah um, Patch is uh, very very talented and I wanted to bring him on because uh, this episode is about uh, drums and Patch you're very good at drums. I at, love drums, At recording, man. at producing them, at mixing <laughs> them. Everything to do with drums. See, for me, live drums, I just turn my head. <laughs> I just go with program drums and I go, yeah, that'll do. <laughs> Ed, come on. But um, it's more of the recording side of drums. It, it just takes so long. Um, take but maybe that's just time, because it? it's me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think it. there's a whole thing behind recording drums. And I mean... <laughs> You know, you need a you need a good drummer. You need a good drum kit. You need a good room, and you need a shit ton of good mics. Of Otherwise, course. it's just gonna sound a bit bad. And that's when splice samples come in. That's when and splice slate trigger come in. for uh... and then everything sounds better. <laughs> exactly. So, Patch, I mean, talk us kind of through you know with uh, acoustic drum recording specifically. Um, you know, tell the listeners kind of what what's your kind of go to as far as um, so. You know, first of all, we've obviously got a nice drum recording. Sounds great. I mean, talk a little bit about how you set up drums for recording, and then we'll talk about the processing side of uh, drums as well. So, um, yeah, if it was all your right, choice we'll just... and money was no option, patch, and you yeah. could have any studio, any mics, kind of what what's your go to drum cool. setup? I know that's a massive question. That's um, a big question. But just like a give us a little bit of a little glance of kind of what your go-to would be for getting the, you know, the drum sound you desire, I guess. Yeah. All right, cool. So, um, I think my favorite drum sound to date has been, um, at, uh, Metropolis studios, which Ed and I know all too well. Is that Studio but, um, A or? Studio A, like yep. first thing, like, I love having a really big room. The thing for me, like drums and like ambience, but like natural ambience, obviously reverb as well. You can kind of fake it in the box afterwards. But um, yeah, Studio A or there's a place in um, in Dollis Hill in London uh, called Resident Studios as well, which I used to use. Big, tall ceilings, like really reflective. You clap your hand and it kind of goes... Yeah, you know, um, you know, I I love like kind of big, exciting sounding drums. Um, if I'm doing you know live drums, pretty much most of the time, it's either that or super dry kind of funky stuff. But um, what's your kind of mic setup? Are you kind of like a, a two mic kind of person, or are you like a twenty mic kind of person? I'm like a twenty mic kind of person. <laughs> I feel like, and it's like, I remember, I remember sat with. Um, I remember sat with Paul Norris from Metropolis and basically been like, why on earth have you put... I was like, oh, I have that mic. And he was like, yeah, it's. I'm going to put it behind the shoulder of the of the drummer. And I was like, why? And then he kind of soloed it and played it with and without. Yeah. And just like the kind of creative mics, which just add a bit of, you know, a bit of texture to it that you wouldn't necessarily get with just the standard setup. Um, but... You know, standard setup for me, if, you know, if I was going all out, yeah. would be, you know, kick in and out um, and a sub kick, you know, the kind of the NS10 cone flipped yeah. around just so it captures the sub. I like the, I think it's the, called the D112 um, on um, on the kick kind of in because it's got this kind of thing on it where you can EQ it straight, yeah. gives it like a smiley face EQ for that kind of clicky, you know kind of thing or i think it's a beta 52 which is slightly warmer um yeah don't have a huge preference for maybe kick out but maybe like a a u47 you know i've I've had really really good kind of results on that that was really cool So very posh drum miking yeah posh you know what i mean it's like just go all (laughs) out do it do it properly (laughs) yeah man get some get some coals on the overheads oh lovely like um i like quite low overheads i don't like 
So like, what kind of distance are you kind of putting your overheads? Because a lot of people use this XLR technique to get the distance space-wise, yeah. but how high are you kind of going up? So I mean, obviously, I'm this always, will depend on room. But. Yeah, yeah. I mean, say I'm in the middle of Studio A, usually like nine times out of 10, I'll go with a like an AB a, spaced pair because I like things to sound wide. Um, and I'll probably put them like, I don't know, how big is a foot? Maybe like two or three feet up yeah. above the cymbals. So they act more as like cymbal mics rather than like full kit mics. Um, you got more control but, then in the. Yeah, because the then there's more control. There's not like too much snare in the in the overheads, which always really annoys me. Um, and um, then yeah, the ambience. It's the right pain when that happens, isn't it? You can't do anything. It's just, it's just annoying. Like compression mm. and all sorts just doesn't get it out. Um, I find the room mics are better for like ambience and full kit. I like doing, you know, using those um, rather than overheads. Um, but yeah, I like, so I like ribbon mic, like Coles. Coles are really cool on uh, on overheads. Yeah. Um, a 57 on on the snare has never, never let me down. Do you do um, snare top like... and snare bottom as well? Yeah, you... yeah. Like, what part honest, do you I... prefer? Some people prefer bottom. Some people prefer like, you know, snare top. What what kind of do you prefer if you had snare, one choice? Snare top. Snare definitely top. snare top. Um, I like the yeah. rattle. Um like I can notice without it, but I've I've got great results before just not using one. Yeah, it's, it's like have you seen that plug-in by I think it's Soft Tube and it emulates the sound of a snare bottom. I haven't. It's actually. really you cool. Have to tell me what yeah. That is. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't remember what it's called, but it's yeah. If you well, you, you just put it on plug-in. your. Would you? Yeah. Would you say would you, would you put it on your snare top? I think so. Audio track. It, yeah. And then it will give just, you. Yeah. It just adds this kind bit of, of sound design there. Sound design plug rattle. <laughs> it's cool, man. Yeah. Um, I'll have to check that then, out. Yeah, I'll, see, I'll dig it up. I'll see if I can find it. Um, yeah. And it was free as well, which was even better. I love a good free plugin. Do you know oh, what? I know. The free plugins, don't, under, you know, people underestimate them. Don't, because they tend to be better. Good <laughs> shit out I've, there. I've paid a lot for some plugins in the past, and I've then used a free one. Like, my favorite one is the chorus. With the, is it T-A-L? That chorus one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's TLO. TLO it, do a bunch of shit. Yeah, and it's like, it's free. And that on electric guitars is like better it's than any other awesome. plugin that I've purchased for electric. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. So, uh, yeah, don't underestimate it. Um, Absolutely but yes. not. So once you've obviously got your, your drums kind of mics set up, obviously you, you're then recording it. And actually one interesting that a lot of... Uh, engineers and, and mixers tend to ask is kind of what level are you kind of recording in so like for me for example I try and get a good kick level and then I balance everything mm. out from the kick level uh, obviously it changes depending on who's doing it and you know people have their own style so you know what do you do how do you do your kind of gain structure with drum within the recording process of it obviously so nothing clips but is there like a sweet point yeah um, I feel like of course, it takes me back to uni, but 90% yeah. sure it's like, um, I think it's minus 12. Minus 12 is kind of what I aim for. That's what I do. I do I do minus 12 with everything, to be honest. Well, there you go. Vocal, yeah. But at the same time, I am, I'm, I'm more of a producer than a engineer in that sense sometimes. I think it depends largely on if I'm lucky enough to use um, outboard. So... You know, I, I I quite like to abuse and just do stuff quickly with outboard. If I know I'm going to compress something horrifically later down the line, like I've learned to trust my ears to the point where I'm happy to slam a vocal with 12 dB on my distressor on the way in. And it's I'm so like, glad you said that, Patch, because we can all, as audio geeks, get so hung up about levels. Yeah, and to right. be honest with you... It, <laughs> My eyes, in my eyes, if you're not clipping, I don't really care. <laughs> literally, that is that is literally it. But I speak to some people and they're like, no, it has to be minus 12 or minus 6. So, you know, Fuck em. It, 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 to me, I'm like, if it sounds good, like what you just said, it is good. Yeah. And so, like you say, you balance everything from the kick, yeah? Is that kind of what you do? So you get a good kick volume level and then you go on from that? Or do you do anything I, I, I do, yeah. I, I start with the um, I start with the kick. Um, get it sounding really nice. Obviously, check phase. That's super important when you're doing drums. You yeah. know, I remember like back in the day, I made this really good impression with with some some guys. This band I walked in on, and they were just all like 
I think it was you remember, you remember Alex Bain on from uni. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I walked in and I was just like, you know, how we met was me being like, hey, bro, your snare is that a phase? And clicked it, and then like the whole whole bottom end just like the snare suddenly becomes this incredible deep like beautiful thing yeah and like like i'll just do that in the box just record yeah it. <laughs> it's game changing though like the difference that it makes the amount of times where i've had to like try and eq something and then i've gone actually like let me just check whether this is out of phase and you'll click it and suddenly you don't need to eq it anymore and it's got like a million times more bottom end yeah yeah and it's like yeah so that's crazy crazy important um I like, yeah, um, if I've got, you know, like compression and stuff and like, I quite like to drive stuff, you know, in, into preamps and stuff because it just sounds awesome, you know. Get it into the orange and then turn it down until, you know, the hardest hit of the drum still yeah. isn't peaking. And then I'm good to go, really. Then like, you just hit record and hopefully everyone plays in time. Well, pretty much. <laughs> and even if they don't, you know, I use Pro Tools and Pro Tools is really great for moving audio around. So, Well, that actually brings us on to my uh, next question. Um, we've had a few people Post ask um, that want to know, um, you know, drum timing. Um, yeah. You know, I do a lot of pop. You do a lot of yeah. pop. Um, and everything, even when it's live drums, although it has groove, everything still se- tends to be kind of slammed to the grid. Because that will also go into another question regarding drum samples. And obviously they need to be, you know, perfect as well. Um, but um, so you've recorded the drum kit. Drummer is good. Yeah. Are you, Drummer is good. Are you are you going to leave the drums as they are? Are you going to do tabs to transient? Are you going to do beat detective? I mean, Ugh. what what's kind of your? Obviously, it will change from time to time. But it, you know, if we just talk a general kind of, um, I guess. Yeah. So generally, generally, like, yeah, I, ha- I hate watching things like this, and they're like, it depends. It's like yeah. we all know it depends. But yeah, so if I'm doing like a pop rock track where it it needs to be like there's lots of um you know there's lots of like programmed drums layered with it so and they're all super super tight you you don't want like flam from like the human and the not human so you know yeah. if i'm if i have like a midi track with a with a, with a kick on it and a layered snare and stuff like that then I will, yeah, I will beat detective or I'll tab to transient. I'll do it by hand, but I'll just put them right on the grid. Yeah. Um, a lot of the time, tabs I'll to just transient do... is the best. <laughs> I literally, I couldn't, yeah. Or beat Whenever detective. Whenever I'm in logic, I'm there just like, At 100. Eh, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> 100. <laughs> well, I try and, yeah, I, I either do like just get the kick in the snare. What? And... On the grid, and do you then leave the overheads natural? That's right. Yeah. yeah. And like hi hats and stuff, it just gives it a little. But then again, when I do that, sometimes the natural like flow of the hi-hats sometimes gets a bit messed up which is a huge thing for me like if you some like maybe the hi-hat was actually the thing that was most in time and was providing the groove and now you've just moved the kick and the snare but not moved the hi-hat the hi-hats are now actually a bit laggy and then the whole groove kind of changes so what do you do in that case then i literally go through and painstakingly do it all by hand um do you know what? i'm so glad you said it because i can spend like I mean, Stay. six hours, six to yeah. eight hours drum timing. Yeah. And sometimes I question myself and I go, I know. <laughs> is it me that's really bad? <laughs> or yeah. or is yeah. that just how long it takes? And when I speak to people, like, you know, like we're having this conversation now, it's like, yeah, that is how long it like, actually takes. <laughs> it's like there's there's so many, yeah, there are like quick fixes to do it. But yeah, like, I mean, people do the, uh, you know, the, obviously the logic flex. What is it yeah. in uh, Pro Tools? It's the other one. Oh, I've forgotten the name now. Elastic Audio. That's it. Elastic Audio. But I always find whenever I use Elastic Audio, especially on like drums or acoustic guitars, but acoustic guitars, for me, it doesn't really work. It just makes everything sound a bit... A bit grainy and Yeah, and I find it does that with drums as well. I mean, you can get away with it, but like you say, do it properly, time to transient, and uh, then you're good to go. Yeah. Do you know what? I've started using elastic quantize audio on my guitars ever since having a chat with you and you just said it as if it was nothing you're like yeah i use like elastic audio on my guitars to keep them tight i was like ah i never thought of doing that and ever since i've done it i'm like oh my god all of my guitars were out of time throughout what, is this history on a on acoustic guitars yeah, or yeah. electric do you Both. find it do you because i, I find as i said because back when i was telling you that i use um i was using logic flex 
because yeah. I, I, I've kind of gone from Logic to Pro Tools. So you know me, Patch. I started on Logic, went to Pro Tools, went back to Logic, and now I'm back on Pro Tools. I, <laughs> but I, I, I always find the Elastic Audio can affect it a little bit, but it depends again if, if it's if it's all within the music, you can't really hear the you know the difference. Yeah, so, exactly. But it does I, make things sound tight. Elastic Audio. It, exactly, it, it it's grainy as fuck sometimes, and it does just degrade the audio. But at the same time, when I do it and it's like a rhythm guitar track, and there's a bunch of other stuff going along, yeah, the before and after is like, oh my god, I will happily, happily take the um, the artifacts. Yeah, do you know what I mean? I'll happily take them if it comes with the, that punch and that kind of feel and the rhythm. Like, there's nothing yeah. like having a sloppy production, like. If you want like a really high caliber, like really high production value kind of stuff, um, for like like a like a modern rock track, for example, half like half of the of 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 mixing it to sound good is is the pre- it, well, is the production, and it's like most of it's the editing. It's like once you make yeah. things in tune and in time, suddenly your ear doesn't go, oh, what like. I need to use a compressor to make those drums pump a bit more and to sound really like smacky. It's like, nah, everything it hits because, you know. I'm so glad you said that as well. Together. Because, because I was having going, this. Brum, brum. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I was having this conversation the other day with another producer and uh, I was saying to him, because we were talking about um, like vocal mixing, like backing vocals yeah, yeah. and lead vocals. And it was actually in the last episode and it was about. Um, you know, vocal line and stuff like that. And sometimes when I'm getting productions through to finish off or I'm getting a mix through to finish off, I haven't actually done anything. All I've done is just times the backing vocals to the lead vocal and they've gone, yeah. oh, it sounds great. And I'm like, well, a- actually, there's no plugins. Yeah, that's right. It's just in time. So uh, for all the listeners out there, make sure your music is in time. And yes, music can have yeah. groove. But as long oh. as everything is got groove within, you know, as long as it's within context. <laughs> this is, I mean, this is, this is where... I feel like I can flex my kind of, um, you know, my taste is is just groove. Like, groove is like the whole other level to um, to like making stuff in time. If you've got yeah. like a, you know, an eighth rhythm, you know, that needs to be like in time. But when you're pushing into other genres and like stuff jazz. like that, like, j- well, yeah, jazz, but even like, like soul is like basically pop music now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like John Bellion is a great example. His earlier stuff, he just goes, I'm going to make something that sounds really, really compelling. And if you were to look at it on a grid, like n- none of it's on a grid. Literally, there might be one element. There might be one kick that's on bar one. And then after that, he plays with like swing and he plays with just yeah. like feel, you know. Um, but everything is kind of feeling it together. And that's the yeah. key. <laughs> that's right. If everything works together, that's the thing. Yeah. Like. You, as soon as you start having like lots of things that are just out of time and they're all kind of in their own space and they're all kind of going like, oh yeah, I'm going to whatever, like a, like a, you know, an ACM band, um, an ACM first year rock band. Do you know what I mean? They, um, <laughs> shout out to our, our music uni, ACM. Um, <laughs> but we, um, you know, when I was like recording bands back, back in the day, like, you know, the drummer would be like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to rush this. I'm going to rush this fill. And then the bass player is still trying to work out what notes he's supposed to be playing. So he's taking his time. And then, you know, the kick happens, then the actual grid line happens. And then the bass happens afterwards. Yeah. And you kind of get this horrible kind of like flam. But if you put them together, you get a super, super tight sound, right? Yeah. And then if you get the bass, if you get, everything in time but the bass is purposefully behind the beat I love then that. you get you get like a whole other sound which is also just as pleasing and usable like yeah nudging stuff back like i mean one thing i, I learned from um from uh bloody john gallen was like you know uh things that sound things that are behind the beat sound more relaxed and therefore more confident so yep. If you're rushing most of the time on any instrument, it means that you are like, you're not listening to the click. You're not really knowing what you're doing, you know? Yeah. Um, you're it's so like, true oh God, though. It's, it's a drum fill. I'm going to, oh, I don't yeah. know what I'm playing. Da, da, da. So you, you rush you, you rush your fills basically. So, but that kind of goes on can be good. to like when we were talking about the, the drum timing, you know, what I find is I'll, I'll time the drums and actually the bass, depending on who the bass player is, I might just slot it into the production and just leave 
either leave as is, and I probably wouldn't do tabs to transient unless there's a specific part that's out of time, then I'll fix it. Yes. But other than yeah. that, you just use your ears, don't you? If it sounds good, yeah. it is good. I know everyone says that, but you just have to, it's a vibe. You've got to feel it. And that's what helps the mix. And this is what I say to people when it comes onto the mixing mix with vibe if that makes sense yeah. mix with the feel of the production and not with the technical aspects now yes mixing is technical but there's a difference between you know you can be as technical as you want but it's got to work within the track if that makes sense you know 100 percent, 100 percent. like um like try and try and like non non-linearity i think is is yeah. a good like segue into into talking about um groove and drums and like um there's if you have everything on the grid and you're trying to do like even like a modern pop song like gen like genuinely like there's 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 uh decisions that you would make purposefully to make something not in time to create a certain effect like Billie and Eilish that, with the claps on one of those Billie songs. Eilish is a great example yeah. like that whole thing is like just done on feel because if you if you have like a clap if you get five clap samples right and you have one that starts just before and then you have a few that start on the beat and a few that start just after instead of getting this kind of like clicky annoying sound you get a kind of wash and yeah. it's like it usually sounds kind of longer. It sounds wider. It sounds just kind of better than just this kind of short, like metronomic kind of kind of shit. Yeah. So, like you know, shakers and like hand claps. Usually, I love I my don't shakers them... patch. You know that. Oh, I know shaker oh one. <laughs> Do you know what? Every Logic song. shaker oh one. <laughs> You'll never get a better shaker, <laughs> and a shaker is really important. I've had. Um, some people say, no, Ed, don't put another shaker in my track. And I go, look, you're wrong. Let, let, let me deal with it. Let me mix it and send it back. Yeah. And they go, oh, I love that. And we'll I go, love yeah, that. Why? guess what? It's got shaker 01 in it. That's, that's, <laughs> that is literally, literally, oh my God, shakers, tambourine, percussion is, is, is everything, you know? Like, yeah. I use like splice for most of my drum programming, but yeah. it's, it will be, you know, just typing percussion in. And just ignoring tempo, ignoring anything, and just dragging it in and being like, "Cool, what what sounds cool?" You know, I do this thing where if my session's in 120 BPM, I'll bring something that's 85 BPM in, and I'll line it up with the start, and it might create like moments of like interesting kind of. syncopation rhythm, yeah, and then yeah. I'll be like, "Cool, I'm going to chop that out, and I'm going to embellish that musical idea," and sometimes it it just sounds better if it's out of time and it creates like a kind of, yeah. you know, a pocket. It creates like a sag or, you know, a drunk feel. You know, you can get that kind of lo-fi hip hop that's like, you know, and that's, you know, I looked at the MIDI of how to actually program that and it's just like, yeah, just grab your hi-hat and just move it, you know. Every, every other hi-hat needs to be lazy yeah. and then the snare needs to be f like in front of the beat. Yep, so it goes, yep. sim, clat, sim, kadim, sim, clat, sim, kadim, sim, clat. and it's like, if you were to put that on a beat, you would like on a grid, you'd never, you'd never be able to achieve that pocket, that, that feel, yeah, that feel. And it's like, and when you put it in, like, there's a bunch of tunes I remember thinking were straight, and somebody's just got a swung shaker and just put it in. Makes all it's the not difference. even, yeah, it's not even a swung song. That's that's my point. They just put a bit of swing in it. Yeah, and they kind of tease it in low, and it's this kind of like non-linearity, you know, yeah, human feel. It's not all perfect. It's not, and it kind of ebbs and flows around, um, and suddenly it, it sounds objectively better. Like you know, I don't think there's many people that are like I like the sound of stuff that is absolutely like too, shotgun too snare, perfect, perfect yeah. everything. Unless it's like a, maybe an EDM song, but. Even with that, like the percussion that I've I've seen before, it gives it this expensive, grown up kind of sound. If it sounds a bit more sounds human. more live a little bit as well, you get that. Yeah, kind of live feel. live to me sounds more grown up. I think. Yeah, that's a good Do way of putting I mean? it. So um, that kind of brings us on to kind of the, the processing side of drums. So you know you've you've got mixing. the feel now. So the you know the listeners they they really want to know kind of the. Um, 
the mixing aspects of drums. So they want to know things like the choice of reverbs that you tend to use. Are you even using reverbs? Because I find, for example, if I've got a big drum kit and you, like you say, you're recording at Studio A in Metropolis, you'll find that you can just use a, a room mic in, in certain yeah. um, I don't scenarios. Use any reverb. Well, I use very, very little reverb yeah. on my... Well, yeah. yeah if you so... take it back from starting from a kick or, or if you just explain your your mixing process for yeah. drums, um, including samples as well, um, then then yeah, go go ahead because right. uh, we're interested Come to then. know. Come on then, I'm ready. So let's go. Yeah, so live live drum kit. Um, I will. Yeah, I'll start. I'll start with a kick. Um, I'll pull up the kick, obviously check the phase if I haven't done already. I'll balance the kicks together. I'll take out any resonances in like, you know, FabFilter Pro Q3. Great Sweep EQ. around. So good. Oh, my God. Best EQ um, in the market. I should be sponsored it, by them, shouldn't I? Easily. Easily, without a shadow <laughs> of a doubt. Um, that thing's, yeah, just great for like identifying the kind of like, boo, those kind of resonances. Because when you take them out, suddenly you're like, oh, my God, this kick is like, it really thumps a little bit more. Um, then, you know, there's kick drums. There's like 250 to 500 hertz, somewhere around there. There'll be this kind of boxiness, which if you take it out in like, if you take quite a lot of it out, it becomes stylized and it becomes quite a kind of clicky, scooped. Um, like a uh, rock, heavy metal. Yeah, like kick. a rock one. It's got lots and lots of sub and weight and it's got lots of like, um, kind of clicky, nice bite top end. Um, or if you want like a really warm one, obviously genre dependent, you leave some of that stuff in. Sometimes it's nice to push like 200 hertz for what engineers call the knock. <laughs> yeah. Um, of of a kick drum, and it it just it just the speakers just react to it more because it's this muddy, weighty kind of stuff. It just sounds a bit more you know smacky, which is great. Um. You know, clicky metal stuff. You want to add a bunch of like top end, um, yeah, uh, like three k on a kick. Don't really like three k on a kick. Like if it's if it's not cutting enough, you I add like a bit 10K. of three k. Ten k is great, exactly. But ten k is great on everything. Twenty k is even better. <laughs> if you're using a mark EQ, I like the forty. <laughs> We're getting very geeky now. That's what the whole podcast is about, right? Um, yeah, take out a bit of 3K and suddenly your kick drum won't like hurt your eyes when it hits, um, which is always great. And then, um, yeah, snares. I find that live snares usually need a lot of top end. So I will happily get like an SSL channel strip and boost like 10 dB of, of, of 10K. Like, yeah. I've done that so many times. Um, I think... Certainly something that I just didn't do back in the day was just hammer stuff, you know? It's like, I, I don't really know why. No, I do know why. I, I don't, in certain circumstances, I don't really know why there's, a, there's this whole thing where it's like, just be conservative. Like, yeah, d you 3 dB of compression, blah, 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 blah. The only way that I can get the sound of like a pop vocal or a crushed room mic that pumps is to use an obscene amount of compression, you know, an yep. obscene amount, like probably totaled together through all the different kind of stages of compression, probably like 30 dB, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, like, if it uh, works, like, you know, it works. <laughs> yeah, like a distressor on the room mic, it has something called a nuke setting. Oh, I've just, used that. That's good. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. There's 26 dB of compression at the top of my meter, right? On your overhead? Um, uh, on my room mics. I'm sorry, on your... All, all my room mics, uh, all my overheads, sorry, it, whatever. But like, it's if you just do it and then kind of step back and come back to it, it's only because you heard it what it sounded like beforehand that it might seem a bit over the top. But when you come back to it, your initial reaction is just like, Phew, oh yeah, like those, those pump. So, you know, use a lot of compression on your overheads and your room mics and just see if it's tasteful enough. Because once you've clamped down on them, and yeah. you get the right compressor, that's obviously important. You can't just grab a stock Logic compressor and hammer it, because it might not be the right one. But something like a distressor emulation or something like that, or like a, what's that Neve compressor called? That's always quite good. Um, yeah. Or even just like, I quite like um, uh, the Renaissance stuff from Waves. Um, what compressor do you really use in your snare then? Are you... 
Snare. Um, it's a good question. I haven't actually mixed a live drum kit for, for quite a long time, but um, Distressor, the Distressor, distressor on Kick yeah. and Snare is great. Um, Are you processing like, samples a lot differently? or I'm or? hardly processing samples at all because they're all from Splice and they're Same. all been mixed already. I find they're I mean? already compressed half the time. Yeah, yeah, they're, all, they're limited. I say, I say you know? half the time. I mean, like, 99.9% right. of the time. Yeah, literally. <laughs> I have to just take them, clip gain them down. And be oh, like, I'm okay, always no clip gaining down minus 9, minus 12 dB. Oh, or... easily, easily. Yeah. And, like, sometimes that's a great thing, but I also quite like looking for, like, you know, obscure samples, which just, you know, are out of phase and terribly wrong, and you're like, oh, my God, why? But yeah. they're a little bit more interesting. So, usually, yeah, top end um, harshness, need to tame a bit of that, and then This is this be... snare, yeah? Yeah, yep, if it's snap. like a bad yep. snare, you know, like open it up nice and bright. You can you can put a lot of bottom end into it, like the crystal and algae trick. He just smiley faces it. Yeah, um, I like the I like using the uh, Andrew Sheps plugin. Yes, there's a Sheps I, one. It's like two at the two twenty. Mm-hmm, you just boost mm-hmm. it up two twenty. Yeah, it and just it, sounds it, good. The, Rounds off the, the bottom same. end. It's, it's it's the knock. It's this kind of really nice kind of yeah. Um, but yeah, snare usually I'm really aggressive with and like. Snare compression, yeah. If you you can get it so it just smacks, you can get this kind of like little. If you set the attack right, yeah, you just hear this like transient of it, and it sounds really really cool. Um, and then um, if I want to, well, yeah, and then pair that with the room mic is obviously when you get the the bam. Do you have your room mics quite low? Because I, I tend to find I find you know it's just style. My room mics tend to be quite low in it, but I know some people like to have Make more of a room sound. Loud shit. You have it loud. <laughs> I love like a big, wide, like yeah. bang in a cave kind of stuff because you know you listen to stuff like Bring Me the Horizon and Modern Rock, you know that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know the snare, the snare room sample because that's you know yeah. what Dan Lancaster likes to use is like. <laughs> crazy and it's massive and like you know i have a few i have a few snare um like just room samples that i like to use and um you know as soon as you add one it's like your snare becomes stereo and which, bigger and, and wider, bigger and, and everything wider, better <laughs> and everything better and that is you know unless you're doing like a kind of silk sonic funky dry stuff which is what you want the opposite but if you want big exciting drums more is more sometimes you know and like you have to kind of push it and go is this is this really really you know is this obnoxiously large snare room sample appropriate yeah yeah it is you know if if, if you then works. listen back and yeah. and everything else is actually a lot more tame then go all right cool let's bring it down but i what think about, it's easier um, to be do you find you use hats a lot because i always find i'm always muting that hat mic <laughs> the hi hat mic yeah <laughs> high pass it a lot and then soothe it like, soothes great lot. Soothes great on everything, overheads, rooms, hi hats, anything harsh. Um, and your toms, I just find I'm just taking out bottom end on toms half the time. Yeah, boosting. toms depends on how they're recorded. Like a lot of the times, if someone's just thrown like what is that mic? The Sennheiser two 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 four one. Oh, I don't know what it's called. Two one two. Oh, I know. Yeah, I know. I think yeah, I know the one you the mean. The one with the clip that's absolute garbage, and every time you touch it, it falls off. Yeah, that one. <laughs> Yeah, I, I that, always man. on the floor top <laughs> I try yeah I try and use like a like a 414 the AKG sounds way better on a Tom I um, find the 414s just sound so harsh they do but Toms are sometimes dull and I'm like you know what I just want a bit of I just want a bit of brightness in, in the Toms do you and like wide work, Toms do you uh, when you're mixing them do you pan your Toms quite wide And yeah I love wide like, do you do literally. it from drummer's perspective or do you do it from uh, audience I do yeah drummer's drummer's perspective you don't do it audio time. really I always do audience S- perspective scats me out when I hear the hi-hat on, on the right hand side I just can't do it I'm like it's wrong which is another yeah. interesting interesting topic like, literally it it sounds wrong and it sounds like. So you're a uh, drummer's perspective mixer. Drummer's perspective mixer, yeah. I Love think it. I favour my left ear. Don't know why. And Maybe when it's it just slightly <laughs> but, better. And when it comes down to um, you know earlier, you were talking about kind of uh, compression, the big topic that people always ask, and there has been questions for this. Yeah. Question is, what are you using on your drum bus if you're using a drum bus? Drum and two. Bus parallel compression are you doing a separate Ooh. parallel compression to your kick and snare or do you parallel compress the overall kit 
That's a good question. And how do you route it as well? Because there's two options. One, you can do it via a send or you can duplicate the drum bus and blend it in. There's multiple ways. Yeah. So they were the questions that people had. So if you can... It's a great question. Go through them one all by right. one. All right. Um, so drum bus. Yep. I, I love... So if anyone has like some sort of analog summing plugin like for slate. example yeah the slate one i'm sure everyone has that because there literally doesn't seem to be a person alive that doesn't but <laughs> their do you know what i mean their console emulation um you know the one that's the the, the mix bus one the gray one yeah 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 so you've got like the channel ones and then you've got like the mix bus one grab that right duplicate it three times yeah and then um set them all to like different tones basically so set the neve get on get one on the neve get one on the ssl g series and then get the um the other one i think it might be a trident or the rc it's trident i think i think yeah, it's trident yeah, yeah. oh there's so, four so, on there i think there's an api there's, one there's a bunch let me see if i can can i i oh, know i can't check whilst things are recording but um get yes yeah, so you get three of those and make sure it's hitting th minus three give or take um, what, on the uh, vu on the VU, yeah. Like, all of them are hitting minus three. Yeah. But, like, back in the day, obviously, when stuff was just going through loads and loads of different analog processing, this kind of emulates it. Yeah. And it's it, it's subtle, but it's also like, oh, like, everything just sounds a bit more forward and a bit more wide. So it's that, it's that kind of, like, you know, like, preamp compression rather than a compressor. It's that nice kind of little saturation. Um do that first. That sounds really, really cool. That would work for um, both um, live and program stuff. Um, then I will usually, usually I'll have like maybe like, I've been quite enjoying the Shadow Hills compressor because that was recently. Love that. Free. Which, which one? Blowing my plug mind. In a, like, plug in the lines plug one. You already, you plug in the and the black one. box. Yeah. Oh yeah, they're brilliant then. They just made them free and I was like, what? Um which was crazy. So I I like to use both of those. The black box um, uh, analog, whatever it is, is really cool for just adding like smack. I don't know what it does. It just it just kind of. Really Do you put that connect. after your Shadow Hills? Are you compressing it and then adding this, or are you kind of doing this all pre the compression? It's a good question. Do you know what? I think I just do it as and when I remember that they exist. Um, as opposed to being like, every time I'm going to do this, you know, if I'm like, ah, oh, it needs a bit more smack, I wonder what, ah, oh, you know what, the black box would probably do that. Yeah, um, I do mid-side on the black box sometimes on the drums. I've I tried that. That sounds fun. I do mid-side on the air band, turn up that air band. It just gives you that kind of high-end yeah. width without yeah, changing yeah, your yeah. kick. I like that. I'm going to give that a go. Give it I a just, go. I just, I just turn a bunch of shit up until it sounds good. Um, well, um, it, it's, it's working for you, so don't change it. It's, it sounds really <laughs> cool. Um, another one is, a, I really, really, really love this plugin, Oxford Inflator on drums. Right? Do you remember when we were in the pub and we had that conversation? <laughs> I I've got no idea what that plugin does. <laughs> and do you know what? I still don't know what that plugin does, right? But Best thing ever. It is the best thing ever because it's got... It either makes it, if you push the, the kind of curve knob all the way to the top, the curve fader, sorry, you get like perceived loudness. It kind of just makes it sound louder without it technically being louder. And then if you pull it all the way, all the way to the bottom, it makes it sound, it's like the closest thing to like what my hardware sounds like when it imparts like sonic yep. kind of saturation analog warmth goodness to it. Like that sounds this nice kind of sheeny kind of soft um compression saturation and if you have it in the middle you get the boat best of both worlds so i'll stick that on like 15 to 30 percent um you, you're adding a lot bus. of gain to your drum bus then that's right obviously are you like trimming taking, or are you yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. You obviously gotta yeah take take some stuff down yeah. Like with the black box, you add a bunch of stuff and then you I was going to say, with, I'll put down. your gain staging can get completely ruined by adding that black box and not turning and then down. Everything that. is clipping and then it's done and then you master it. No. Um, yeah. Yeah. Obviously, like, trimming off, you know, A being it and trying to trying to make it, you know, nice and stay the same level um, yeah. as you go. But, you know, that's that that's is key. Fun I part. always tell people that if you, if you, let's say you have your, your drum bus coming in at between minus 12, minus six, kind of, you know, so you've got the fed room. Yeah, when you add plugins, kind of keep it around there. Try and you don't want to be there. hitting like 
minus 0.2 because you're not going to have any headroom left. <laughs> and like, I mean, you could just I've... trim it at the end, but still. Yeah, just... I, I'm just, I don't, I'm not knowledgeable enough. I'm yeah. too scared to just pull it down, which is, which is really Yeah, funny. I have this thing. Of, I, I still think it does something with inside the computer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, mate, I'm exactly the same. I'm like, yeah, but if it, you know, surely it would sound better if you do it pre than post. It's, it's but... an irrational fear, Ed, and we <laughs> both have it. But The um... things we worry about. I know, man. It's crazy. Um, so I, yeah, that's the that's the kind of dynamics and like punchy kind of stuff that usually tends to flatten it out and give it punch and give it all of those wonderful things. Then um, yeah, stick a pro cue on it. Do you know what I mean? Just to kind of maybe take out some overall little yeah. massaging of tone. Um, do you do any like, additive EQ on it? At all? Yeah, so I quite like putting it through. I've recently bought myself um, the SSL Fusion, very which fancy. Is really cool. So yeah, if you're feeling a bit fancy, then do this. If you don't want to spend an obscene amount of money on a pretty box with flashing lights, then are you going to um, make me get one now after this? Do you know what? I feel like you'll get it, and then you'll be like, ah, okay, this is actually <laughs> better than like you know just a a. a SSL compressor yep. it actually just does more <laughs> but it also means that your mix kind of just sounds worse when you don't use it right um, <laughs> which is terrible for like everything else but um, sometimes I'll put that across it and it's got like a cool like low and high shelf so I might just give it a bit of open top and a bit more of like the super deep analogy lows a bit of the vintage drive section of it which is kind of really really just soft warm compression sometimes that's really cool and then um uh what else do i do with it then i just like yeah does it sound good if, if it's that good it is it is usually just just that do you like put a reverb buses. on your drum bus at all like on the overall thing or do you just no sometimes on a snare if i that's you do you know what reverb is actually because some people love it on kicks that's why i was like you know some people are like i need a big I, I yeah. get worried about reverbs on low end. For me, I'm yeah, hurt. me too. <laughs> Fil filter it out. Just anything below three hundred, I'm just like, nope, nope, nope. But yeah. most of my kick reverb is um, room samples. I love or the room kick. recording. Yeah, exactly. So like um, Stephen Slate trigger, I love that because it's quick and easy to just throw it on a duplicate. I find it so, so you don't have to align. If let's say you have to, you have to align your samples to your. Oh, the recording snare right. just do slate trigger stick it on slate trigger it's first in really insert great plugin. yeah <laughs> done the job so I, <laughs> and i i probably should but i don't i don't tend to process them much because i feel like they've obviously gone through this kind of you don't need to, process yeah. of yeah they're mix ready and they sound really great so i try throw I think those on that's something to be Jesus said great. i think for all the listeners you know less is more and it really is <laughs> like sometimes obviously there are certain elements where, you know, or certain mixes where you have to do a lot. But I always find the best mixes I've done or the productions that I've done. And I'm sure for yourself, one, it's been done very quick, mm -hmm. not taking that long. And two, you haven't really done much. It's just that the song's great. <laughs> I love doing that. If the production is sick and the performances are great and it's been properly produced and engineered, mixing it is an absolute dream. Yeah, because um, you don't need to. You don't need to like mix it. I feel like it's just fundamentals, when, volume and panning. <laughs> yeah, I feel like most most modern day mixing engineers they are not mixers at all. They are just fixers. They have to do like their job is to just make this the 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 piece of music the track more compelling to listen to. And I feel like in modern day you know standards, yeah. like, like such a huge percentage of that is is actually fixing stuff. So it, it's 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 doing the things that we talked about. So it's making stuff actually sit together. Yeah. Not through not tonally, but through nudging stuff around. Um yeah. I feel like you you would know if something was purposefully like really lazy. Because you'd go, oh, okay, that's that's been done with some sort of like finesse and intent. Yeah. Whereas you can also tell when something is just out of time and sloppy and you're like, this is this is terrible. So my default is to just go, all right, well, I'm going to tune the vocal. I'm going to align, you know, the drums. I'm going to align the bass to the drums. I'm going to time stretch the guitars so they sound hot. And then you do that and you hit play and you're like, oh, I need to do a lot less mixing now. It's and just balance just do... between the instruments. <laughs> yeah. Pull up the faders and then you're like, okay, so maybe so I like doing like really broad stroke EQs. I'm, I'm such a... 
big picture kind of mixer rather than a nitty gritty. Yeah. Um, which it sometimes is terrible and sometimes is is great. But as long as I can play it against my reference tracks and it sounds the same, yeah. you know, I don't care that I haven't low passed this shaker and gone through and notched out a frequency yeah, that may matter. or may not be there. Yeah. It's like if something's wrong, I'll fix it. And if it's not, then leave it alone unless, you know, I, I always to, say to this safe, to people. High pass it, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I always say to people, you know, people don't get us to do our job to do lots of things. What they're what they're getting us to do is to what not to do, if that makes yeah. sense. It's just the, it, the it's, final... It's, it's when to know, up. especially in mixing, it's, when, it's to know when to leave something and when to do something. That is what is the skill, I find specifically we even production at and mixing it's Mm -hmm. you know like you say about the drums you don't need like 20 different eqs on your drum bus because if you do to me there's something wrong wrong in the recording (laughs) like (laughs) like, you know so i so we've spoken then about the compression on the on the drum bus and we've we've talked about uh what, what you use then as far as um parallel compression goes do you do parallel compression on the you know, as a bus on the drum bar so do you just parallel yeah. a few things or kind of what's your kind of go-to for parallel compression if any at all my go-to is i'm a lazy lazy fuck so i actually just <laughs> choose a compressor that has a mixed knob on the um, drum bus on the drum bus so like my shadow hills yeah and to be honest with most compressors that i use unless it's one that doesn't have a mixed knob i feel like it's just a, a thing i do i'll back it off to 80 percent on everything. I but... always find that with any plugin, I like like I feel like especially with Suve, I don't know why, yeah. I just feel like it works best at like 70% or 80%. Yeah. It, when, when you have all these plugins there everything's much. at 100, you're like, again, do I trust the computer? <laughs> I'm destroying it. And I think that's that is huge. So the Shadow yeah. Hills is my main like compressor slash cuz I'm doing so much compression through other means, i.e you know the vintage drivey kind of stuff um the oxford inflator the console stuff that technically is compressing the signal so if i want to do co- parallel compression i'll either do it for a specific purpose um and i i prefer things that are like thick rather than punchy i think yeah like you know stuff that's kind of like really punchy drums and it's like really in your face yeah, like I don't like that as much as a good amount of punch, but then you can kind of hear this smooth, like the cymbals are like, as opposed to, yeah, you know yeah. that kind of compression, that really kind of like long release, like stuff. a bit more sustained, yeah, fast attack, exactly. I really like sustain because it sounds full and glossy to me. So, okay, like, that's a good way yeah. of doing it with the, with the mix knob because you know you get some mixers and they're like doing it a bit of kick bit of snare they're doing a parallel bus with just you know and all of that stuff is is great you know and it works but it's interesting to see from your point of view patch kind of what you do in 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 your processing and then the last thing about drums then would be going on to automation um do you do any automation on drums obviously this is going to be genre um, specific so sometimes i find when i'm doing if it's like a jazz track that i'm mixing i find that maybe you want you don't want the snare to be so loud in certain areas so you kind of have to do automation do you, to take it down do you have a mixed jazz ed i have done <laughs> i love that but you know <laughs> I, I prefer i'm more of a pop guy i prefer pop. i can say i've but, never mixed a jazz record but you're so right but but it's obviously seen... in pop everything is so compressed it doesn't really seem to be as much automation as there is in kind of more jazzier stuff so yeah, just in general, do you find that you're doing much automation or do you find that you're not really? Or, um, I, Truthfully, I, I don't do a huge amount, but I do a lot of automation in, um, in my production. So I will, I use clip gain on Pro Tools so much because I don't really work with MIDI drums. And if I do, my velocity, you know, knob or my little velocity markers slash yeah. my clip gain is yeah. always moving around. So it's kind of the same thing. Um, I will, yeah, so like biggest use of, biggest use of automation for me would be, um, again, bringing up like symbols 
bringing up, riding the volume up of the sustain of the cymbal. Yeah. So it doesn't just go, Psh, and then you can't hear it. You know, that long sustained crash is like, I really, really like that. Snare rolls, you know. Yeah, put them up, yeah. Give it a little bit of a, you know, give it a bit of a vamp. I like to actually grab shaker tracks that are stagnant, right? Shaker, 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 shaker. And kind of get it and kind of make it go. Yeah, so it adds to the feel. And you can volume. create feels where you just grab your mouse and put it on, you know, put it on like right mode or touch mode or whatever it is. I love and, that touch mode. You can just ride it up and just yeah, feel it. <laughs> and like literally close your eyes, don't look at the meters and go, is this exciting? If I push it up and take it down and you can kind of perform, you know, it's the most fun I have as a mixer is like performing stuff doing something in, in a pass. Well, that's the same as, as what I was saying earlier about vibe. In, right? You're, yeah, you're, you're giving the uh, patch per shell vibe. vibe on your song. Exactly, exactly. And it's, a, it's, it's another level of human touch. And I feel like people just respond to stuff that isn't clinically perfect Yeah. Um, a lot of the time in, in a positive way. You know, um, there's nothing like a great quantized four to the floor kick drum, but there's also nothing like having this kind of, this, you know, this, snare roll or this like transition that kind of doesn't go it kind of goes yeah you know it's got a bit of finesse and a bit of like you know kind of thing to it so i find I do a lot automation, of automation like that yeah i find that i try and uh do a lot of uh the last mix i did i think i did uh i used the sound toys native um the distortion is it oh, devil lock devil I, lock i think i just turned drums. that on in the chorus only and turned it off I did automation, but not volume. I just did the bypass thing. Mate, just, that's that's, that's on quite... my drum bus all the time. Oh, that one. Yeah, you like that. Yeah. I love. If you've got a really like weak... fast attack, got to make sure it's on fast. Oh, God. Oh, just hammer it. Yeah. Hammer it and then set the set the parallel to it. I use that all the time. I just I just forget because, you know, there's so many plugins. There's so there. many plugins, isn't there? <laughs> there's there's, there's too, too many. many. Thank you so much for, you know, being on the um, podcast with us, Patch. I mean, is there any Did advice you, you can give our listeners? You know? Welcome. And, any advice? Uh, I'll put you <laughs> on the spot now. General life advice. <laughs> Don't drink too much alcohol. Get yeah. lots of exercise. And, uh, you know, um, take risks in all of your mixing and your music production. Because being safe is being boring. <laughs> well, thank you so much for uh, being on this uh, podcast, Patch. Dude, and, you're uh, welcome. It's been a pleasure. It's Great been, to chat. It's uh, been fantastic. So thank you very much. Good stuff. That's, Chat soon, my fine friend. Thank you. That's the uh, end on Twitch as well. Um, oh, one last thing, actually, just for the Twitch. This won't be for yeah, the podcast. Um, I did have some questions regarding some vocals. Oh, um, okay. And the if you can quickly kind of just give the uh, listeners um, or listeners or viewers on Twitch uh, kind of a, what how you process a lead vocal, very just a quick kind of... <laughs> Look, a quick glance. kind of like, oh yeah uh, i know. can do that i can do that yeah so um if it's a, if it's well uh distressor so i hammer it with the distressor i have a i have oh i have outboard yeah whatever i like to throw it <laughs> you through. love that distressor <laughs> <laughs> i have i have a neve 8801 which is yep. a channel strip and i have a distressor so i really love throwing a lead vocal through um the neve and again being quite a quite like abrasive with the input so it's hitting orange most of the time and the top 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 peaks sometimes it's even hitting the red but because it's analog distortion it sounds better um obviously to taste then um some tonal shaping obviously vocals vocals love top end um making sub you know stuff bright is great so i, I do end up sometimes really cranking my high frequency um thing do you do tonal um, shaping before cutting Yes, yeah. So I'll do the outboard, the general tonal shape, and then yep. I can be like, okay, cool. You know, like obviously take some low end off. Take like two point five k. Sometimes is a bit too bitey for me. Yeah, I feel like if you take a bit of that out and a bit of top end, and then like two hundred fifty, three hundred, four hundred hertz is a bit is a bit bit or not so it nice. goes into the box like that already done. Goes into the box with that. Yeah, with um a um, distressor setting with uh, 10 to 1 on the Optobe setting. Um, the, the the detector circuit taking, in, like, being more sensitive to the upper mid, that kind yep. of thing. Um, distortion 2, 
uh, on the audio and then an input of whatever the signal is. Uh, attacker on eight, release on zero. Um, love that. Hammer it between six and, you know, 14. Um, yeah. So it's nice and nice and level. Then I'll use the um, the Pro Q3. I'll take out, you know, I'll do another kind of um, high pass. I'll do some uh, multiband kind of stuff on the kind of like the kind of really proximity effecty stuff around what i don't know 180 is that multi-band on the dynamic eq of the fat filter on the, the pro q yeah. Yeah. yeah love doing that yeah um maybe like 2 db um a quite healthy notch around 520 hertz like there's this kind of rattly frequency which yeah. you, when you take it out it sounds really nice you, you you get that on the u87 which is what you use and i use that i'm always taking that round that freaks out and i think yeah i think it might just be the mic i don't i don't know uh, maybe maybe but yeah i, I find yeah. that i'm taking out a lot and it, and it sounds really really cool um, nice. and then yeah working up like a lot of a lot of my a lot of my vocal mixing is just getting things bright but not harsh there's so much of that there's a plugin um, for that. It's called Soothe. Well, <laughs> that yes, is on my own vocal bus. <laughs> Always. So Soothe is. I usually I boost top end into Soothe, and right, it yeah. basically gets brighter and and smoother. So obviously I'll be I'll be adjusting how much brightness and how much Soothe and you know to taste. Yeah. Um. The Fab Filter DSA is amazing. I love that. Yeah. Um. I I will use Arvox or um. Uh, like our compressor, the Rena Renaissance one. I really love that. Um, there's a Josh Godwin trick I've been kind of using with the SSL compressor. You oh, know, the, where it's like uh, a high ratio and yeah. low. Um, the channel. Oh, you yeah. Talk, yeah, the SSL. I think is it the 9000J or is it, or is it the SSL? I can't remember he now. Uses, he uses the Plugin Alliance one, but I, That's the I 9, just use the Waves one. Yeah, I mean, I don't, same I don't thing know. anyway. All same thing to me. It's just <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's a plugin. Just like uh, no, it's not. No, um, it's all frequencies. So... <laughs> Literally. Um, uh, so yeah, a bit of like broad tonal shaping again if it needs it with that. After your then... first compressor. Or... Yeah, so I'll usually do Neve compressor, and then I'll go in the box a bit more EQ digital. Yep. Pro Q. Then I'll have uh, DSA. Then I'll have like another compressor of different flavor, usually like Arvox, maybe yep. just shaving a little bit off the top, or our compressor, or both, depending on how I'm feeling. Yeah. Um, I don't do much parallel compression just because the distressor does much hits it. Yeah. Really does. It smooths it out beautifully. So sometimes I'll use parallel compression, which will be like an eleven seventy six or something. Yeah. Um. Sometimes I won't, depending on depending on what it is. Um, then sometimes I'll have like a Poltec on the end to brighten it even more just for that specific like Poltec, uh, 16K kind yeah, of stuff. 10K. Love that. I boost about really 7 to 8 dB on that half the time. It's, it's like this kind of... It does what Soothe does. It brings sharp. high end out, but it doesn't yeah, make yeah, it sound yeah. horrible. <laughs> it's very, very, it's very, very pleasing. Yeah. I love doing that on the vocal. Um, I love doing... Uh, so we've got that. Yeah, vocal automation is great. Um, do you touch? Um, do you do the touch and do you ride the whole lead vocal throughout the track? That's another thing because yeah. I find a lot of younger mixers don't really do a lot of vocal automation on volume. They kind they of... They can't be bothered. They just compress it more. And yeah. Like, oh. um, that's, um, that's interesting. So, yeah, I do that. and um, Or like uh, vocal rider. Do you know what I mean? I like oh, doing the that waves well. one. Is that yeah, good? Yeah, waves vocal rider. Uh, it is. It can be. It can be. Well, do you put that on that the end of the vocal chain? I'm trying to work I, it. I do it before my compressor. So it will technically, it will be after the distressor. I mean, I do things all wrong until it sounds good. Um, to be honest with you, that's the way to do it. Every vocal is different. That's the number oh. one question I always, you know, people always go, well, how do you do vocals? It's, it is different every time. Yeah, it is different every time. It's different for the singer. But no, sometimes, because yeah, if I'm, I record, if, I, if I've recorded it, there's a different process to if I'm just mixing it. So if I'm mixing it, I can I can choose where the neve and the distressor comes in. So I'll I'll do like all my EQ first, and then I'll do the compression usually, just because yeah. that's what I was told was right. But if it's if it's been recorded, it will go through. Some yeah, general you, you, you're just shaping. saving some work by recording it yourself. Yeah, so yeah, I always yeah, find I, when I'm mixing yeah. other records, I'll always put the DS first in my chain. Nice, because I tend to record with a DS very lightly, and and I don't know. You do EQDS or I do DSEQ. Same, same yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, I always do that before the first compressor. Mate, 
Sounds literally better. like <laughs> the, one of the biggest things for getting vocals to sit right is going through with a fine tooth comb again as we talked about earlier yeah. get in there and just do the work and it will sound Clip better game. You know? and, and, and tune Clip it and game. time it <laughs> yeah tune it time it the and plugins get... mean nothing yeah with no t- tuning or timing <laughs> yeah literally vocal i spend so long on vocals because they're the most important thing in any vocal li- like driven thing they're usually the loudest they're usually the most central you know yeah. every note has to be perfect and as soon as you start taking out the non musical parts like the breaths the yep. consonants all of that nasty stuff if you find a way to butcher that so it doesn't you know doesn't sound really overbearing because you use the distressor you know the breaths are like you must be clip gating every single breath <laughs> every single breath bro every single one but you get to a point it just becomes a process it's not like this laborious task it's like eq and a vocal it's like all right cool let's clip gain it and then suddenly oh all of your compression and all of your eq moves react better to the vocal because it's the non-musical things that are going to jump out to you and annoy yeah. you like the cut is going to be too 3k heavy or 7k because it's just going to bite you but if you've already taken that down all that happens is the the body of the note gets nice and bright and it's like oh this is cool so that's my biggest piece of advice for vocal mixing is 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 the editing side you know get in there and take out the the bad bits so you can mix better you know what i'm saying so everybody watching on twitch take that advice that's that's a big uh, that's a big piece of vocals as as we spoke about you know before the stream you know it's the thing that everybody <laughs> wants to uh, wants to know and talk about, and I think, as I say, my biggest advice, and it was the same as yours, is is if the vocals are in tune and and the takes are good, and the, and the timing's good, you don't really need to do a whole lot in the box. It's true. Uh, like, yeah. you know, I I record vocals basically for a living. That's kind of my main gig, and yeah. like the difference between a, I mean, <laughs> difference between a good singer and a bad singer is everything. It is everything yeah. <laughs> so i i had this really long string recently of working with fantastic singers and then i have i had a, another session where the singer was was trash and i was just like ah uh, you know melody it's, it's yeah but even <laughs> even melody yeah. it's like you know it's so dependent on on how a singer's tone is sometimes you literally just can't fix that with eq and compression you literally just can't do it so yeah the best vocal like the best vocals recorded that you're going to come across is amazing singers because you'll find that you can actually use a terrible mic and it will still sound great. So that's a huge thing. And then lots of compression, lots of DSing to make the nasty kind of stuff come away. Fantastic. D-click stuff, D, you know, Russell, D, sibilance, all of that stuff. We'll have to do another um, whole uh, podcast (laughs) on the vocal tuning. Because that's a big one. That's like... Yeah, that is that's literally everything. I could talk to you for hours about that shit, but yeah. Well, I know right. you're a busy guy, Patch. So, uh, well, thank you so much for joining on the stream and also the podcast. Yeah, um, hope it was hope it was good for everyone watching, and um, if you've learned something, great. and hope you go away and make some sick sounding drums. <laughs> <laughs>